Saints and sinners, remembering that we are all simultaneously both, we're glad that you're here as we come and we worship together. As we come and we speak of the sing of the sweet, sweet spirit to be found in this place. Now, I, I was kind of laughing at that, uh, that line about the sweet expression on each face because I guess we just have to imagine it today, knowing that we're not all seeing each other and even though we have a few more people sitting out here this morning, a few folks helping us in worship, that still I didn't get to see anybody's face because of our masks. But we know that it's there when we come and we worship the King, when we come and we remember that we follow Jesus all the way. I do want to share a few announcements, I, especially here in this month as we move closer to the Advent season and we have three or four of our traditional missions that kind of fall in this season. One of those is Operation Christmas Child, as we collect shoe boxes of items to send to children around the globe and to share Jesus' love with them. If you would like to pick up one of those boxes, just let us know in the church office and we'll make sure you can get that. We'll arrange for you to pick it up. Uh, we have plenty of extras, so please come and, and share in those. And we'll be taking those till the end of the month. For those of you that would like to support Angel Tree or the Thanks Loving Feast, we are doing both of those in a kind of a different way. Angel Tree, we're just accepting funds to be able to buy Christmas gifts for children who are needy in our community. You can send a check to the church or you can go online and there's a, in the drop down, there's one for Angel Tree. And the Thanks Loving Feast, Bill Piercy is behind me, but Bill and his crew are still planning on us providing Thanksgiving lunch for anybody in our community that wants it. We won't be able to be indoors. Uh, it'll all be pick up uh, outside, but just know that we're still going to do it. And instead of taking donations of food for that, 
If you would like to make a financial gift, and we'll share it, and, and uh, Bill will use it to buy all the turkey and trimmings for Thanksgiving. And I hope that you'll also be remembering the Christmas mission offering in honor of Lottie Moon, as that's be coming up in the next few weeks. Even though we can't be church like we always are this Advent and Christmas season, we don't get to do everything we want to do, and things are going to be different for everybody, we still are very thankful that we can be on mission for Christ. But we do have some news about this place, this building, as we are moving closer to being in this sanctuary. And with that in mind, I'd like to call up the chair of our building team, Reeves McGlowan. Thank you, Dr. Cameron. Uh, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be in this place this morning, and I can't tell you how excited I am for all of our congregation to see what uh, has been done uh, with this facility. Uh, it's not the same as it was, but it is absolutely beautiful and will be as meaningful as it ever was. Uh, I want to take just a couple of minutes this morning uh, to first thank you for your patience, for your perseverance, for your support as a congregation, for our building team and, and the subcommittees on that team. Uh, these folks have worked really hard and are really proud of what they've done and, and we all can't wait for you to see it. Uh, the second thing I wanna do is to, to give you an update on where we are with finishing this project. You know, we've talked a lot over the last uh, few months about the light at the end of the tunnel. And to be honest with you, sometimes I wasn't real sure that that light was ever going to show up. But I read something the other day that I think made me feel a little better, and that was, yes, there is light at the end of every tunnel. It's just that some tunnels are longer than others. This has been a long tunnel project. Uh, but I would say to you this morning that the light at the end of that tunnel is bright, and it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, we're almost finished. Uh, there are only really four things that need to, to be done to finish up this entire project. Uh, one is, is we gotta fix our elevator. Uh, that, pro that process will begin on Monday. Uh, there are three stained glass windows that have to be put in and that, they will be put in the week of November the 11th. Uh, we have fantastic new audio visual equipment that will be added to this sanctuary uh, by the end of November. And our organ is being completed and will be brought to Mount Holly and installed hopefully by the end of the first week in December. So we're a month away from having this facility ready for occupancy. There are two things that happen at the end of every building project. One is, is what we call a punch list Many of you have done that with, with your homes. And that's where the owner of the building walks around and tells the contractor, you need to fix this, you need to fix that, that nail hole needs to be filled in, this door doesn't close properly. That punch list has already been done on the education building and Bean Construction has just about completed all the items that they have to fix. Last week, the punch list was done for this sanctuary and BEAM is beginning to do those small things that they need to do. So BEAM construction uh, will be out of here very shortly. Uh, the other thing that comes at the end of a construction project is a certificate of occupancy. That's a very necessary piece of paper that is given to the owner of a building by the county, and essentially what that says is we have inspected all the work that's been done on this facility uh, and we find that it is within the realm uh, of what the state of North Carolina and Gaston County says that we must do in the way of ordinances uh, and other rules and regulations. Uh, and not having that certificate of occupancy means that the building is not open to the general public. Having that certificate of occupancy says that you can use a facility for the purpose for which it was intended. Now, obviously, the purpose for this sanctuary is worship. Uh, and Dr. Cameron, I would ask you to come forward. We have a certificate of occupancy. 
uh, from Gaston County. And it says, permission is hereby granted to use the same for following purposes, and that is church assembly. So we still have COVID to deal with, but the building is ready for occupancy. There we go. <laughs> Amen. God said, this is my son with whom I am pleased. There's no splendor, no beauty we would fancy. This is my child in whom I take delight. But this one carries the load of a servant, not the scepter of a king. This is my child whom I have called. But this one demands justice from all earth's nations. His words shall judge our own. This is my child whom I uphold. But this one would release the judge's prisoners. He would set the captives free. This is my child whose hand I hold. But this one is a man of sorrows. He is no stranger to grief. This is my child. I give him to you. Surely this child will bear our suffering on his shoulders and carry our rejection in his heart. Wounded for our transgressions, he will be cut off from the land of the living. Like sheep we have gone astray, like a lamb he shall be led to the slaughter. And still our God declares it. This is my beloved child, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him.
We'll now hear our scripture lesson that comes to us today from the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so. Now it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I was uh, outside on the front lawn on Wednesday looking at something in the building and somebody walked by me on Main Street and they yelled out, it's over, it's over. And I kind of said, well, you know, we're still counting votes. And, and they said, no, the political commercials are over. And I, I think that's how many of us feel that uh, um, we're kind of weary of 2020 in so many ways. But I, when we come and we pray this day, I think my first and most fervent prayer is for peace and unity. Uh, unity for our nation as we turn over a new leaf and we move forward. No matter who you voted for on Tuesday or whenever you voted, well, whoever I voted for, it's time for us to, to come as a unified nation together. And uh, and I pray that we would do that, particularly when it comes to how we deal with COVID and how we fight a virus together. And I pray that as the numbers continue to increase that God's peace would reign for so many. And I do have a personal concern I'd like to share. Uh, I have a dear friend named Ken McGee. Ken was one of my church members in Benson years ago. And uh, Ken's a, just a few years older than I am and uh, not Back on my birthday, actually, the beginning of October, he was uh, motorcycle riding up in the mountains and had an accident and uh, was taken to Johnson City, Tennessee. He's been there for a month in the hospital and has now been taken to the uh, orthopedic hospital in Atlanta um, and uh, um, so far has been paralyzed. And we just um, pray for God's peace for, for Ken, for his wife Joy, for their family. and. Uh, we pray God's peace would reign for us all. With that in mind, let us go and let us pray together. Loving Shepherd, we come to you this day. We come remembering that you have come to us as a babe in a manger. That you have set an example for us by being baptized in the Jordan River. But we most of all remember that you, at the end of the day, are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you call your church to be unified. We remember in the Gospel of John, before you went to the cross, there at the Last Supper, you had a prayer for your disciples, and you prayed that they would be one. And so now, Lord, we lift up that same prayer for the church of Jesus Christ today, that we would be one. We pray that for our nation, that we would be unified. That we would look past partisan divisions and instead be unified in following your love and where it guides us as a people. We pray that we would be unified in listening for your still, small voice and following the wisdom that you have for us. And that when we see our neighbor that maybe has a different political candidate sign in the front yard than in our front yard, we would see that person not as someone in another party, but instead we would see them as our brother or sister. Help us, Lord, to put aside our differences and be united as one people, united as a nation and united far more importantly as a Christian church, that we, your church, would never let differences divide us 
and instead we would consistently and constantly work to show your love. Because we know that there are so many in this world who look at us. They look at the divisions that exist amongst us. And they say that the church of Jesus Christ is divided. Why should we trust them? Help us, Lord, to turn first and foremost to you. To follow the babe in Bethlehem. To follow you to the Jordan River to baptism. To follow you all the way to the cross and beyond. And we come this day proclaiming exactly that. That we follow you to the cross, to the empty tomb, and to this very moment. We pray that your peace would reign in us. We pray that your peace would reign for all victims of COVID. We pray for wisdom for our nation's leaders and the leaders of our state and our community as they face a pandemic. We also pray for concerns of our heart like my friend Ken. We pray your peace would reign. In all things, Lord, we pray your peace would reign. In the name of the one who is the Prince of Peace, we do pray. Amen. And so we come and we share that peace, remembering that it is Christ who calls us together. We are his family. We are his children. We are God's children all brought together in worship together. No matter where you are watching this, literally around the globe, we are God's children together. And so may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Share the peace of Christ with neighbors near and far. Peace of Christ. special welcome to all of our children this morning. We are so delighted that you have joined us. Today we come to a really sweet story in the Bible of when Jesus is baptized. This is one of my favorite stories because Jesus comes on a day where so many other people have been baptized to take that step in his own journey. You see there was a man named John, John the Baptist, who had been baptizing people all day long at this lake and all of a sudden Jesus comes up and he says I need to be baptized and John is a little confused he's thinking why does Jesus need to be baptized by me and he says Lord I need to be baptized by you you who have done no wrong who are perfect and he knew exactly who Jesus was and he's confused why Jesus and Jesus says this is something we need to do in order to fulfill all righteousness and so of course John agrees and Jesus is baptized and as Jesus comes up out of the water the scripture tells us that heaven is opened and a light comes down and the voice of God says this is my son with whom I am well pleased and I love him and I'd like to think that that is what God says when we choose to take that step in our faith journey. When I was younger, I got baptized and I had had several conversations with my parents, my pastor, several Sunday school leaders and members of the church before I decided to walk down the aisle during the last hymn on a certain Sunday. It was Mother's Day and I quietly crept out of the pew and as you can imagine, I was very nervous. I had to go in front of the whole congregation to come down and talk to the pastor who was standing at the front of the church. And I told him that I had decided that I wanted to ask Jesus to live inside of my heart so that one day I could enter the kingdom of God. And I also had chosen to be baptized. So here I am talking to the pastor, and as the hymn concludes, he turns me around to face the congregation, and he announces this decision publicly. And I can tell you that room was filled with so much love and joy and excitement for the decision that I had made. And in the days and weeks leading up to when I was baptized, I had several conversations with the pastor about what it meant, what it means to ask Jesus to come and live inside of your heart forever, and what it means to be baptized. And you can see behind me, this will eventually have somebody as the, our first baptism here. Our baptismal doors were open, and somebody will be the first one to be baptized in this beautiful sanctuary. 
And much like this baptismal here, that's where I was baptized. And I can remember walking down the steps into the baptismal pool. As you can imagine, I was not very tall, so it was very hard for me to see over. And I remember the pastor kind of lifting me up and presenting me to the congregation on this really special day. And I remember in the first pew, my younger sister was about four at the time. And as I was getting baptized, she's cheering the entire time. She's waving, she's yelling, she's so excited. And you know what that reminds me of? That's what God is doing. When we choose to enter into his kingdom, God is cheering for you. He's rejoicing alongside of us. When we choose to say, I want Jesus to come and live inside of my heart forever so that I, one day, can enter into God's kingdom. And what a wonderful day that will be. So I hope that you will think about this week what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to ask Jesus to come and live inside of your heart. And one day, if you choose to be baptized, we're going to be rejoicing right alongside of you. And we can't wait to be right there cheering you on as God says, this is my son, this is my daughter, welcome to the kingdom of God. So I hope that you will think about that this week as you remember God's glorious kingdom and the decision that we get to make to enter it one day. Let's pray together. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus' example. Thank you for Jesus' example. Help me remember, Help me remember the glory of your kingdom. The glory of his kingdom. Amen. Pray with me. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, you are the giver of all good things, and we know that your word tells us so. Lord, we ask today that you would accept our gifts that we're about to receive, use them for your glory. May they bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the homeless. We pray, Lord, that you would multiply our gifts and accomplish them with more than we could ever imagine. Dear Lord, all that we have is yours, and we know that you will always, always supply our needs. So we pray that you will uh, use these gifts to build up your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Beats unfailing heart of love, beating for his little ones, calling each of us to come. Be Sometimes it's always amazing the way God works out things, particularly for worship in ways that, that I surely didn't intend. Um, uh, listening to Taylor sing that song by Stephen Curtis Chapman, which is one of my favorites, and I, I don't know if I've ever talked to Taylor about that. I was thinking about that because uh, my Pandora, the, my streaming, my music streaming channel in my study uh, is... The one I use the most often is one called Fernando Ortega, and it's a collection of hymns. And, and often that very song that Taylor just sang is, comes up. And, and so maybe Taylor's being across the hall from me, he's heard it so many times that it just kind of sunk in that Kendall wants me to sing that eventually. Um, but uh, but I, I was thinking about that because it's kind of interesting that I'm thinking about Pandora because I was already thinking about Pandora because I, I made a shift on Monday. Uh, and again, most often I use uh, my Fernando Ortega channel. Um, uh, sometimes during, I have a Lent channel. I have a few others uh, that I use at different times of the year. But, but I did it early this year. I switched to Christmas music. And, and maybe it was all that's going on with COVID and, uh, and the election cycle and just frustration and sadness and and all of those things that that we're all struggling with um i just decided and and this is hard for me y'all know because i'm an advent purist i mean i'm a believer as you well know that you put up your christmas tree for advent and you leave it up all the way through epiphany on january the 6th i'm i'm a real purist about this whole thing but but i just decided this was the year i would just start listening to christmas music early and so i I have two Pandora channels that are nothing but Christmas music, and one of them is Amy Grant Holiday. And uh, I put it on that, and I, I, almost immediately it was Amy Grant singing Emmanuel, that beautiful song that reminds us of the, the word, the Hebrew word that means God with us. God with us. And I, I needed to hear that. And, and, and I will tell you that every time I hear that song, I, an image pops into my head, and I'm showing my age slightly on this one, but, but uh, back in the 80s, uh, during the presidency of President Reagan, they had one of those uh, Christmas in Washington specials, and, and Amy Grant was the singer, and, and they had Amy Grant up there, and then this beautiful, powerful um, choir behind her, and uh, she sang Emmanuel. And if for those of you, see, some of you who are younger don't get this, but, but back in the good old days of albums and cassette tapes, you had to listen to the songs in the order they were in the original. So when you had put in a cassette tape, literally it would go from one song to the next. And the only way, you couldn't just hit one button and go to the next song, you had to fast forward through it. And that was such a pain, none of us ever did it. You would just stick it there. And so, um, but it also meant for people who produced an album, they could put songs in a particular order to kind of have them flow from one to the other. And, and so on that Amy Grant Christmas album that came out when I was in college, uh, there, you go straight from Emmanuel to O Little Town of Bethlehem, her own arrangement of that. And, and it's powerful and beautiful. And I never forget her doing that in Washington, D.C. and just kind of blowing it out and just how powerful that is, and every time I hear that song, that image comes to me of um, the exuberance that Amy Grant did that. I needed that exuberance this week. I need it now. And, 
as we come to our stained glass windows, and, and I will tell you that originally when I slated this sermon series, when we months ago talked about me preaching the windows, and I shared that with the building team, I really thought everything would be complete by now, and that all the stained glass windows would be in place, but not only that, that the baptistry behind me would be completely ready, and we would probably do a baptism today, and I would literally preach the sermon from the baptistry. I've done that a couple of times over the years, and uh, I thought it would be a perfect Sunday to do it. Now, I, I will say, I, when I've done it, I've done it by choice. Uh, I had a friend many years ago who was baptizing, and uh, um, he uh, leaned over. He was wearing ga- like those, those uh, waders for a fisherman um, to keep from getting wet in the baptistry. I don't tend to do it that way, but that's what he was doing. And he leaned over too far, and water pulled over his waders, and then he couldn't move, and he was trapped in his baptistry. So I'm glad that uh, that's never happened to me. And, but I had planned I would preach from the baptistry, those beautiful doors you see behind me, and open them up and, and preach from there. But I do want to show you those images. Now, if uh, you look over here, you'll see one of the images is the actual window that you see. When you, you look at that window of the nativity, that's the actual window as it is in place. And the next window is the baptism of Jesus. Now, remembering, as we've talked for several weeks now, when you are on the north side of the building, the Glendale side of the building, those are our Old Testament windows. And it's the idea that follows the narrative of the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And so we go from creation to the fall of humanity to the Ten Commandments to King David to the prophets. And Jesus is the great king, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. But then when we come back to the south side of the building, the fellowship hall side, we we see these images of the gospel of Matthew. We have the nativity of Jesus, the birth of Jesus. We have the baptism of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000. We have the crucifixion and the resurrection. And as we come to these two images today, I I hope that you, when you looked at those images, you noticed a few things. One of the things that is in those images, in both of them, is the the Greek letters chi and rho. The the chi kind of looks like an X, and the rho is kind of like an upside-down P. But those are the first two letters in Christ in Greek. And so when you come into the sanctuary and you look up at that window of the birth of Jesus, there in the very center, in a tiny place, is a chi and a row. We remember that he is the Christ. And there in the baptism image is, again, the chi and the row. And if you look at it carefully, there's a shepherd's crook when we remember that he is the good shepherd. And so when we come into this place, we are going to be proclaiming every single day, just looking up there, that he is the Christ. We will remember that Jesus at his baptism and the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove that's in that image, and God saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And so we come this day to listen to him. Now, most of us, when we think of the Christmas story and when we come to Advent and Christmas, we go to the Gospel of Luke most often, Christmas Eve every year, Luke chapter 2, in the days of Caesar Augustus. But I think it's also important to notice what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 2. He tells us of the Magi coming to the baby Jesus. I've always said that We can often tell so much about the Gospels of Luke and of Matthew just by looking at how they tell us the story of the birth of Jesus. In Luke, we are told that the angels go to the lowly shepherds. It is Mary, a woman, who gets the great news that she is to bear the Christ child. In Matthew, it is a member of David's house, Joseph the father, who is told, and and The star shines at the east, and the magi come from the east to see the child in Bethlehem. It is powerful people from afar who come to the baby Jesus. 
And of course, it is King Herod in the Gospel of Matthew. A king is worried that this child will be the Christ, the anointed one of God. That this child is going to usurp his throne. And of course, we all know on this side of the story that, that when it comes to earthly kingdoms, Jesus never tried to be what Herod thought or the people who wanted him to be another King David, but instead he is the king of kings because of his love for us all. He didn't come to just rule one nation. He came to rule all nations for all time and to do it by his love. I've thought a lot about the gifts of the Magi this week. There's a priest in the, K- K- uh, the Church of England named Leslie McCready, and he, he tells the story when he was a child of going to King's College in London and, and seeing that amazing, huge painting, Rubens painting, the adoration of the Magi. And he looked at it, and it's, a, it's an image many of us have seen in different ways. And if you haven't, just Google Reuben Adoration of the Magi later, and you'll see it. And, and the first thing you'll notice, of course, is that the clothes are not really the clothes of the first century. You know, art usually tells us more about the time it was done than the time that originally it should have been. And then there are, there's an old man with a white beard, and then there's a younger man, and then there's, there's a, a black man who are the three magi. Now, we don't actually know. We have the tradition that there are three magi, Melchior, Caspar, and Balthazar. Um, as I often say, we, we don't know how many magi there were. There could have been 23 of them. We just know there were three gifts. They could have had a bunch of cheapskates. We don't know. It just tells us that magi came. These wise men from the east, where we get our word magic from, they were wise. We don't know. There could have been two. There could have been seven. We just know they brought three gifts. But the tradition that is found in the great church historian, the venerable Bede, as they call him in England, is that their names were Melchior, Caspar, and Balthazar, and that, that one of them was an old man with a white beard, one of them was fair-skinned fair and beardless, and one was dark-skinned. And that's where we get that image that Reuben picked up. But what we do know is the reality of three gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. I was thinking about that a lot this day. So I was looking up at that image just the other day, the one that is in place of the nativity of Jesus, as it has that star over the manger, the light of God beaming down, and the chi in the row, the Christ in the manger. And I thought of a child getting three gifts And as you look at that image, think of the child in that manger getting gold, being told even at his birth that that he is going to be a great king, that that untarnishable, beautiful, expensive material is going to be given to him, that he is worthy of gold. But then also he's given frankincense. And and we remember in Psalm 141, let my prayer rise up as incense, this beautiful smelling thing. And I I, I was watching just the other day, I was watching uh, Rick Steves Europe. And Rick Steves was in a cathedral in Spain and and they had one of those things called a censer. And I've most often seen it as just something that the, the priest is just carrying and he's kind of waving it and this smell goes out. I've experienced that in Orthodox churches several times over the years. But but This censer was humongous, and it was swung from a huge thing, and it swung all over the sanctuary. It looked like a humongous swing going over the sanctuary, and and this smoke was pouring out, and the smell was going out. And we think of the frankincense, this powerful smell that is to inundate all, to bring them all, but also to bring them and remind them of the sweet-smelling nature of God's Spirit. And so this child is given frankincense. And then finally, the child is given myrrh. Now, we've often talked about myrrh was used to uh, embalm bodies, 
in the ancient world. Not quite the gift that many of us give. Uh, uh, many of you know that Tori and is about to have a baby shower soon, and I, I highly recommend none of you give myrrh for, to Tori for the... I didn't ask her about that, but I don't think it's on the list. I'm just saying. But, but it's powerful to think of this child getting that. And, and, and McCready in his sermon about this said something that I've never thought about, that, that not only is myrrh used for embalming bodies, it reminds us of death, but it was the Gentile way to embalm bodies. Because remember that the ancient Jews would bury their dead the day of. And so they didn't have the same embalming rituals as other societies around them. They weren't trying to make mummies like the Egyptians or to do it like the Greeks. And so here we Gentiles find our way into the story. Even at the birth of Jesus, the Magi come from the east. Gentiles come and adore the child. But not only that, one of the gifts is a very gift that is to be found in the Gentile world. God says from the beginning, we are part of the story. We are part of his story. And so when we look up at those windows at the birth of Jesus and the baptism of Jesus, we are reminded of his birth, but we're also reminded of his death. Even before we get to the fourth window, the three crosses that remind us of Calvary, we are reminded of the death of Jesus even in his birth by the gifts that he receives. And then we are reminded, every single one of us, that he is the one who has brought us into this world and he will be with us even to our deaths and beyond. If I was in the baptistry this morning, I would use those words that I always use at a baptism that come from Paul in the book of Romans. For we are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. That even the very experience of baptism is to remind us that our old self is to die so that we can be brought into glory of his glory. That his love permeates us all and carries us through no matter what we face in this life. On Monday, I changed my Pandora channel. I changed it to Amy Grant Holiday. And yes, that meant I had to hear a couple of songs that were not uh, songs of the faith. But I listened to Emmanuel, God with us. And I thought about how timely it is. Too often we wait for December to come. We wait for Advent and Christmas to say these words. But I needed to hear right now that there is this child whose name is Emmanuel. And he is with me right here, right now. And he is with you right here, right now. And we can count on that. that we can come by this sanctuary any day of the week and we can look up there and we can see that image and we can be reminded that he came into the world. He stepped down from glory to come into the world as a child in a manger for you and for me to offer us a possibility to forgive us of our sins. Emmanuel, God is with us. Here in this time, a dark day, it's a time of sadness, I needed that message Monday. We all need that message. And for a God like that, we all can say, thanks be to God. And so we come and we sing a hymn of response. Soon and very soon, as we remember that God's kingdom is coming soon, Jesus invites us. As he was baptized, he invites us to the baptismal waters. 
I can think of soon and very soon in two contexts. One, soon and very soon this building will be completed and that baptistry will be available and we can throw open those doors and I can baptize folks and I can say we are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. I say thanks be to God for that opportunity. But for each of you, their word is going out. Will you follow him into the baptismal waters? Will we follow him? It is he who does the calling. It is up to us to respond as we sing together. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Soon and very soon, soon and very soon, this place will be opened up and we will come and we will worship in person together. It may not be as soon as we'd like. For some folks, it may be a while because of COVID. But that day is coming. But also, far more importantly, soon and very soon, we will be in the kingdom. It may be a short time for some of us in earthly years. It may be a long time. But in the vast expanse of the God's time, it is always soon and very soon for us to be with our Savior. And as that we proclaim this day, as we proclaim his birth and we proclaim his baptism. Let us pray. Lord, we look forward to the day when we can have a baptism in this place. But we remember the baptism of your Holy Spirit never changes, that it can happen anywhere. And we, like the Apostle Paul, proclaim one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we pray, Lord, that we would be about sharing the truth of your love to all. Here in this time, Lord, remind us of the gifts given to you, but also the gift of you to each of us. And remind us that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And help us evermore as we love you, love one another, and love the world. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.